Propaganda. What is it exactly? When you hear the term, we might think of false information and the fake news media. And which media you think is fake news probably depends on your own worldview. And you might specifically think of information disseminated by governments. But the term propaganda refers to information used to promote a particular cause or point of view. To be propaganda, information does not need to be false. A Facebook page that regularly shares news articles about crimes committed by immigrants because the person behind it wants to promote an anti-immigration sentiment is propaganda. The stories are not false, but the person sharing them has deliberately decided to only share negative stories about a particular group, and not to share stories about crime being committed by non-immigrants. An example like that shows the limitations of fact-checking when it comes to countering online hate. But that's not what we're looking at today. We're looking at propaganda that makes no pretense of being true. Stories that the creator and the consumer both acknowledge to be fiction, but which nonetheless exist to promote and reinforce a particular viewpoint. In an earlier video essay, I quoted historian and cultural critic Richard Slotkin, comparing the way Somali Muslims were depicted in the 2001 film Black Hawk Down to the way monsters were depicted in the 1986 film Aliens. While I could be wrong, I don't actually think anyone who worked on that film, which is a dramatization of real historical events, was making a conscious decision to depict America's enemies as monsters. Black Hawk Down was used as propaganda even if the filmmakers had intended to just make a thrilling action movie. George W. Bush screened the film in the White House and for members of Congress when promoting the war on terror following the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center and Pentagon. But that's not what I'm talking about today either. I'm talking about fiction written with the express purpose of being propaganda. Specifically, Kindness by David Isles. Isles makes it explicit in the preface of the book that its purpose is to make readers think about the political situation in New Zealand. In 2020, whilst discussing the upcoming election in New Zealand, my sister asked me to write down my thoughts on the political situation. In the end, I thought it would be better to write a political novel. And kindness is the result. It can be read simply as a novel, or the reader may wish to consider the changes that have and are happening around New Zealand as they read, and to think about the direction that the country is heading. Isle's vision of Aotearoa in the mid-2030s is a world where every far-right prediction has come true. It's a place where service workers wearing hijabs call you comrade before reminding you to use the COVID tracing app. A future where celebrating Anzac Day has been banned and all pizzas are halal. The protagonist is John Kerry, a salt-of-the-earth Kiwi farmer from North Canterbury whose father fought communism in Vietnam. John is losing the family farm due to a series of legislated environmental regulations that have lowered the value of the land. His narration tells of farmers clashing with environmentalists and Antifa, quote, well known for their violence towards those that support conservative views. At first Antifa had the advantage due to the element of surprise. Unfortunately for Antifa, though, they had underestimated their prey. These were not office workers they were attacking, but hardened men used to a full day's physical work. Oh. Any man who could lift an 80-kilogram sheep multiple times a day would do short work of Antifa. Does it say how the Antifa got the elements of prize and overpowered the police cordon? And the bloody Antifa members started to retreat. At that point, the police reacted, moving to break up the protest. The farmers were not going to fight the police. The protest was over. <laughs> the farmers might have won the fight against Antifa. However, little had been achieved. This was no more clearly demonstrated than the TV news coverage that night. The farmers were the top story with the heading. Thug farmers attack environmentalists. First at a rally in Wellington and again at a rally in Christchurch, protesting the visit of a Chinese trade delegation, where police shoot dead 23 protesters, including John's brother. The event is ignored by the mainstream media, who are complicit with the tyrannical socialist government, led by a woman who is heavily implied to be current New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern. She's never referred to by name, characters call her Supreme Leader, or in one instance, that horrid woman with the smile and big teeth. Who are Antifa then? Are they just, you know, like, are they like the thin blue line guys, but under the communist state? Like, are they like the equivalent? Like, it's a real uh, struggle when you have multiple political narratives that... Yeah. Don't make any sense. And it's ridiculous. Trying to in... together. We follow John as he travels from his rural farm to Christchurch, which in this story has been renamed Armantown, 
Christ and church were just too much to handle for the new citizens, he thinks to himself. Perhaps it all started with those famous hugs and headscarves after that terrible day in 2019. John encounters a city he barely recognises. He sees that the Catholic Cathedral College has been renamed to just Cathedral College. There were Indians, Chinese and some African. Some of the girls wore headscarves. He's shocked to hear the Adhan emanating from the Ballantine's department store, which has been converted into a mosque. Yeah, so Ballantine's is coming up. Everyone's walking <laughs> in the same direction. They're all wearing traditional Islamic kind of outfits. Um, I mean, just play us on, Byron. <laughs> As he got closer to Ballantine's, things didn't look right. There were even more people now, mostly men with their beards and white dresses, and the call to prayer was getting even louder. And there it was. Ballantine's Mosque. The department store was no more and had been turned into a mosque. <laughs> Ballantine's Mosque. The department store was no more and had been turned into a mosque. That is um, just a, a near perfect piece of prose. Thank yeah, you, David Isles. You truly delivered. Like... Kindness is New Zealand's contribution to the long and sordid tradition of far right speculative fiction. The best known books in the genre are Jean Russ Bale's. 1973 novel The Camp of the Saints, in which hordes of non-white migrants overrun Western Europe, and The Turner Diaries, written by the then head of the neo-Nazi group The National Alliance, William Pierce, and first published under a pseudonym in 1978. Pierce's novel tells of Earl Turner, who joins a terrorist group known as The Order, who commit a series of attacks with the goal of starting a race war. Writing in the New York Times in 2018, Ian Allen described the Turner Diaries as a hybrid of fantasy and how-to, noting that the book has inspired hundreds of terror attacks in Europe and North America, including the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing, in which 168 people died. That attack was a copycat of one outlined in the book, right down to the time of day and the type of explosives used. Kindness is a stockpile of conservative fears. In addition to the heavy-handed commentary on Islam and New Zealand's economic relationship with China, kindness finds a way to incorporate just about every moral panic and conspiracy theory popular on the fringes of New Zealand's right. COVID contact tracing is portrayed as a form of mass surveillance, and the protagonist muses that the virus itself may be a hoax perpetuated by the socialist government. The character Sandeep, John Kerry's sycophantic farm employee who speaks in broken English, despite having lived in Aotearoa for 23 years, tells him, You know, boss, I don't like some things they teach my kids in school. Like, boss, they teach my eight-year-old kid that she can be a boy if she wants. I don't like that, boss. Oh, okay, cool. That's another bingo card. When he travels from Springs Junction to the city, John does so by train. Currently, there's no rail line from Christchurch to Spring Junction and frequently comments in his narration about the high-rise apartments and public transport hubs. These changes are attributed to United Nations Agenda 2030, a set of largely unremarkable sustainable development goals that loom large in the anxieties of many conservatives. Isle struggles to portray this future of walkable neighbourhoods and accessible mass transit as an inherent negative, resorting to describing the apartment buildings as grey and dreary, and the trains and stations as being dirty and poorly maintained. His protagonist comments on a sign describing one of the suburban transit hubs as a China Belt and Road Initiative, referring to the Chinese global infrastructure development strategy, linking in the mind of the reader urbanism in Aotearoa to Chinese economic power. Kerry is estranged from his daughter who was indoctrinated into communism while studying political science and communications at the University of Canterbury. She had gone on to become a teacher. He thought she would have fitted in well. Most teachers were leftists, indoctrinating young minds with ideas of inclusivity, sustainability, fairness, all with communism just under the surface. We have discussed socialism and communism in our last two classroom sessions. Anxiety is about the values instilled in children and young people through the education system return when John and his love interest Jennifer opposing his home buyers. In actuality, this is part of their purchase of passage out of the country. The pair visit the school and the apartment complex. He had no interest. The whole thing was just a charade. Out of boredom, he looked at some of the library books. Sally oh, okay. and Mummies. And I'm not a boy or a girl. The titles were self-explanatory, and they sickened him. 
a is bunch this, of those. Is bunch it of those are Bingo, bingo. Yeah, but we've already ticked off these boxes. I can't believe that he's used a library to just like pull it as much exactly, shit as possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Imagine using a library to bully people. There was also a book, They Stole Our Land. The mm. cover showed a Maori boy standing on a cliff overlooking a bay on which was an English sailing vessel. Oh. Pre-written history, he called. <laughs> Fuck yeah, okay, that's another, that's the first, I was waiting for it. That's the first actual, yeah, that's the first actually, Um. the, the first Maori <laughs> acknowledgement <laughs> whatsoever. Oh shit, that's a bingo actually, by the way. Bingo already. Yeah, 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 so we got a bingo. <laughs> After John gets into a bar fight in Spring Junction with the local Socialist Party branch chair, who is portrayed as a lazy and corrupt drunk in contrast to the hard-working farmers of the region, he suspects he is under surveillance and makes plans to escape the country with Jennifer and her young son. Luckily for him, Jennifer's deceased husband was an anti-government activist who had the connections required to make that happen. They meet with Paul, a South Africa-born mercenary who is assisting dissidents with passage to Australia, where apparently refugees from socialist Aotearoa are welcomed, unlike asylum seekers from elsewhere. He learned that Paul had been a member of the Canadian Joint Task Force 2, an elite special, special operations unit. He had moved to New Zealand when was in his early 30s and hoped to join the New Zealand military. It never happened. Too many affirmative action policies and recruitment. And being a white South African, he had no chance. <laughs> oh, okay. Famous disadvantaged group. Yeah. With the help of Paul, they plan their exit. John is not going to undertake this escape unarmed. His weapon of choice? The rifle buried on the neighbouring farm of his friend Steve, some 16 years before the events of the novel. He remembered Steve's reaction after the mosque shooting in 2019. If they come for my guns, I will bury them, he said. Licensed firearms owners were enraged when within 14 days of the shooting, most semi-automatic rifles were banned. Some claimed the firearms ban was all part of the socialist agenda. John digs up the rifle from its hiding place and hides it in the back of his getaway vehicle the car he's stolen from Jeremy O'Brien, the Socialist Party branch chair he brawled with in the bar earlier. With Jennifer and his son, they travel to the East Coast, hoping that being in a vehicle registered to a Socialist Party member will avoid being stopped and questioned. O'Brien is in hospital after another drunken brawl and unlikely to report the vehicle stolen. When Chinese soldiers who patrol the country's coasts for people trying to leave without an exit visa, they spot our protagonists, along with other escapees boarding a small boat. John makes use of the rifle to ward them off. He dies in the ensuing firefight, but others, including Jennifer, make it to Australia, where she becomes friends with John's estranged daughter, who has now renounced communism. And uh, I just thought, well, I'd take this book out I was given yesterday and promote this book because it is very, very good. And here's the book here. David Isles, and it's called Kindness. The only way we can actually stop this in reality I'm talking about now is by getting together and reading this kind of stuff because this is the future. And the only way we can stop it is by getting together and communicating, forming some kind of movement that goes against the current of Propaganda from the media, academia and this government because they are winning. If you're not yet familiar with the man in that clip, Lee Williams, he was at one time New Zealand's most subscribed far-right YouTuber after a video he made about being visited by police following the 2019 mosque shooting in Christchurch went viral. The police visit was likely prompted by earlier videos on his channel, such as footage of him speaking at a rally against the UN Migration Compact where he claimed... Europe and its people are being replaced via mass migration. While standing beside notorious white supremacist Philip Arps. Arps was the first person to be charged with sharing the shooter's livestream video, which was quickly deemed an objectionable publication after the event. The conspiracy theory that the UN Migration Compact, officially the UN Global Compact on Safe and Orderly Migration, would lead to the replacement of white Europeans, appears to have been an inspiration for the shooter, who wrote, Here's your migration compact on one of his guns. How many of you know about the global compact for migration? How many? Hardly anybody outside there. She and her turncoat, Deputy Prime Minister Winston Peters, have already signed the compact just before the Christmas shutdown, so we wouldn't notice. 
Williams was given his copy of the book by Ian Fogart, another YouTube personality with considerably less reach, and the author of the self-published Six Politically Incorrect Essays on Feminism, Islam, Multiculturalism, Jacinda Ardern, A Vote for Tommy Robinson, The EU, and more. Fogart had renewed kindness on the right-wing blog The BFD. There will be those people saying, oh, this is simply fiction. That sort of thing could never happen in sleepy old New Zealand. To those people, I say there may well have been many Venezuelans or Hong Kongers that once thought the same thing. I also say to them that since the New Zealand Prime Minister changed to somebody who was once the President of the International Union of Socialist Youth, the direction of political travel has only been one way, and it has not been in a direction that leads to more freedom. The website where kindness could be purchased is now offline displaying a generic page from its hosting provider. But no doubt the copies from Isles 2 print runs are circulating, being passed around the attendees of the anti-government rallies that have become a regular occurrence since the start of the pandemic. Should one of these attendees later decide the use of violence against their perceived political enemies is justified? Isles Book alone would not be responsible. In the same way, none of the YouTube personalities watched by the Christchurch shooter bear sole responsibility for his actions. Kindness is another entry into a media ecosystem of misinformation and hard right ideology that we're seeing the consequences of the world over. It's barely significant on its own, but it's a symptom of a much larger problem. We haven't even scratched the surface of how insane it gets. We hit off the right wing talking points, bingo. Nice. Who wrote it, this? Um, hold hold like up the thing again. A sentient Facebook comment. You know, is he a crank or is he uh, New Zealand's Nostradamus? The truth takes know. many forms. <laughs> He would mean like would free happen. books? That's communism. <laughs> <laughs> I never read the Aotearoa Times because it's just a communist rag. In conclusion, I give David Isles kindness zero stars. All hail the supreme leader.